Your Majesty, Excellencies, Laureates, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to speak today about the need for safe water and actually the interconnectedness of um, water for agriculture, water for health, drinking. Uh, it's tied together. Uh, for example, in countries like Ethiopia in Africa, Cambodia in Asia and India, and especially Bangladesh, less than 20% of the population has access to safe water. And the result is that 200 of every 1,000 children under the age of five do not survive. Diarrheal diseases is a killer of children and continues to be a very important disease. Respiratory infections now claim deaths as number one, but the diarrheal diseases, waterborne diseases, is number two. The linkage of water and agriculture is clearly powerful because the problems range from arsenic, as Colin Chatters has mentioned, um, to the problems of diseases from intensive agriculture, uh, animal husbandry resulting in, for example, the uh, distribution of cryptosporidium, a parasite, into the water system and, of course, creating a human problem. The studies that we've done in India have been um, historic studies. We've taken data from the 1873 to 1948 and we've determined in a very recent study about to be published that in the area around New Delhi and compared to, let's say, Dhaka, Calcutta, and um, Hyderabad, there's a difference between epidemic cholera and endemic cholera along the coastal areas. What's been fascinating is the linkage that we've determined between air temperature and rainfall that has given us a model that we've been able to link very closely to the current problems in Haiti. Now, I'd like to emphasize that most of the emerging diseases and the re-emerging diseases are from the environment. They're from uh, cohabitation with animals in the sense of the uh, uh, swine flu that uh, ravaged uh, Asia a few years ago but particularly the waterborne diseases, and in this case, uh, the bacteria of cholera uh, are associated with plankton, concentrate in fish and shellfish, with the end result that uh, in a population with very, very poor sanitation, there is, of course, transmission person to person, but fundamentally, the source is the environment. And that, I think, is an important message to understand. Now, in some recent work that we have done, particularly in Bangladesh, studying the distribution, let us say, of methods of filtration to purify water, we have done studies where we've discovered in the last few years that when we extract the DNA from the water that is being used as drinking water, there's not a single pathogen. There are dozens of pathogens, almost two dozen pathogens are distributed in water that is not purified. Now, in the studies that we've done with cholera victims coming into the hospital in Bangladesh, we've discovered, and we are about to publish, some very interesting findings. The victims come in, indeed, carrying Vibrio cholerae, the causative agent of cholera, but in addition, they will carry between three and 10 other pathogens, Salmonella, Shigella, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, Rotavirus, and some other viruses. In other words, the victims that are coming into the hospital very likely are suffering from a community of infectious diseases. And one of the discoveries made was that Giardia, when present, causes the cholera bacterium to produce more toxin. We don't quite know why yet, but these are some very, very recent findings, and I think they're important to understand. What I emphasize here, a study whereby we trained women to simply filter water through cloth. 
This is for the remote villages where there is no other alternative. And empowering women is, of course, the very strong message that I would like to leave. If you educate the women on the value of safe water, you've educated the family, and you've, in essence, educated the community and the country. It was very easy to demonstrate to the women in Bangladesh that by simply taking useri cloth, folding it six or eight times, and then filtering the water, which quite obviously was much cleaner, not exactly the same as we'll have on the table outside at coffee break, but nevertheless, much, much safer. The fact is that we were able to reduce cholera in uh, this long-term study, which I reported earlier here at the Stockholm Water Meeting two years ago, we were able to reduce cholera by 50%. Now, in a, an extended study where we have been working in Africa and in other uh, countries and uh, communities in, in, um, in India and Asia, we've been using what are called kiosks, that is a community approach whereby we've emphasized with the Safe Water Network a group with whom I've been working in New York, just one of many possibilities. It's not the only type of approach, but it is simply to emphasize that it's a holistic and it's an integrated approach that is needed for providing safe water and a healthy um, source of drinking water for families and communities. The emphasis is economic sustainability and capacity building. That is, by moving into the community and investing capital for the construction of the kiosk and recruiting and hiring and training local individuals to operate the kiosk and then to charge a very nominal fee so that the water then is, the clean water is then a commodity rather than simply free uh, and therefore misused. With a few rupees per several hundred liters, we're able then to provide a capacity for the community to maintain its own capability for uh, providing safe water to its members. We've emphasized reduction in cost and operation and even in capitalization to the minimum so that we could extend uh, the kiosks to many villages in India and carried out a very careful distribution strategy determining how far from the kiosk the water then would be used and being able to maximize um, the utilization of individual kiosks and then to position many kiosks in a way that will be effective for um, uh, volume usage by the communities. It was very interesting that we also had to um, work with the community and the culture. It turned out that in one of the communities in particular, the medicine women who were uh, marketing herbal solutions were um, losing money because the safe water uh, ended up with less disease in the community. And then they began a campaign to disparage the kiosk. But we used good reasoning and we co-opted the medicine women as agents, paid them a nominal salary to um, explain why the kiosk water was much more effective. And that in turn allowed greater use of the kiosks. Now, Colleagues Kellogg Schwab and um, Melissa Obispo at Johns Hopkins University have been doing the analyses of the um, effectiveness with respect to disease reduction. And we're very happy to say that with the kiosks, um, we have been able to reduce schistosomiasis by 80% by the simple filtration provided in these central kiosks uh, for the communities in Ghana particularly, but also in India. The uh, integrated approach uh, of understanding the culture, empowering the women, the families, uh, introducing 
a business approach uh, to the distribution of water has led to then a healthy community and a much more effective uh, availability of safe water. The program approach is capacity building. It provides uh, a source of safe water and clearly we're able to reduce waterborne disease. Now, the connectiveness to agriculture is multifold. Firstly, with healthy children, the nutritional capacity of the food that is provided is enhanced. Uh, productivity increases simply because uh, the community with less disease burden is economically more powerful. And so the livelihoods of the individuals has been much improved. I will conclude by saying that in the words of John Muir, the founder of the Sierra Club, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he, but I would also add, and she, finds it hitched to the rest of the universe. And that is my message um, in this very important session. And Your Majesty, I thank you for the opportunity to make the presentation. Thank you.